Good morning. Welcome to Divinity Lutheran Church. We're here to worship the one true triune God and to be spiritually fed uh, through his, his word and sacrament today. Uh, this is the last Sunday in the Christmas season. We continue with that theme, what child is this? The answer today is the child who turns slaves into sons. God will bless us as we worship today. Let's begin with our opening hymn, Come Your Hearts and Voices Raise. Separate us from your love 
and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will make your descendants very numerous. Abram fell on his faith, face. God spoke with him. He said, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Your name will not be Abram anymore, but your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a large group of nations. I will make you extremely fruitful, and I will produce nations from you. Kings will come out. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you as an everlasting covenant throughout their generation. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, chapter 4. And when the set time had fully come, God sent his son to be born of a woman, so that he would be born under the law, in order to redeem those under the law, so that we would be adopted as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts to shout, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. If you are a son, then you are also an heir of God in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in the verse of the day. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God.
gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, beginning with the 68th verse. This is the song that Zechariah sings after the birth of his son John. Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited us and prepared redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Just as he said long ago in the mouth of his holy prophets, he raised up salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, in order to show mercy to our fathers by remembering his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant deliverance to us from the hand of our enemies so that we are able to serve him without fear, in holiness, righteousness before him all our days. This is the gospel of our Lord. So maybe you've seen it for the hymn of the day. Christmas Eve 
service. In the Lutheran Church, there's this, this line, not just the Lutheran Church, but definitely in the Lutheran Church, there's this tradition of children being very involved in the Christmas Eve service, singing songs, carols, Christmas carols, uh, reciting uh, verses from Scripture that they memorized. There's something that often happens, not always, but often happens in these Christmas Eve services that you know, when you can see it from my perspective, you see it, it often brings smiles to a lot of faces. I call it the ebb and flow of the Christmas Eve service. You can tell which sections of the songs or the verses that the children had an easier time memorizing because they're pretty loud, they're not afraid to be loud. But when they get a bit softer, uh, when it seems like then their memory is not firing on all cylinders. Some of it was just harder to, to pound into that long-term memory. Now, actually, this year was an exception to that. Our kids really had everything memorized super well. But I think you all know what I'm talking about. Kids get really loud when they really know it, but they don't, they get a bit, a bit softer. We all hate to forget things. What your wife wanted for Christmas, what you were supposed to do at work, maybe that, that task that's not really that important, but if you forget to do it, you just feel like you need it. Or forgetting the, the answer to an essay question. I hate that feeling of, of forgetting something. When we remember something that we thought we had forgotten, we tend to get louder telling a story, and all of a sudden we remember something we forgot, the voice gets louder. Both forget and remember, those words can mean very different things. If your teacher tells you to remember the date of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, that's very straightforward. December 7th, 1941. Remember that date. If your father tells you, now remember who you are and remember who your family is. That's a totally different thing. Wrapped up in that kind of remembering is family pride, honor, tradition, faith for us, behaving a certain way. That's the kind of remembering we're going to talk about. Remember your redemption as God remembered his covenant, and as those who have been redeemed for a purpose, to serve God. Zechariah is one of the more interesting characters in the New Testament. He just appears a couple of times, uh, but they're pretty significant, really interesting events. Zechariah was a very blessed man, a man of God, or godly man. He was a priest, part of this, this privileged class of a small group of people who could actually go into the temple. So he was actually part of an even smaller, more privileged group than that. Zechariah is one of the few human beings in all of history who spoke with an angel. Where did Zechariah go wrong? This discipline can seem pretty severe, can it? Remember what happened, of course? He was struck mute, unable to speak. That seems like a pretty severe discipline unless you're really aware of, of what Zechariah's sin was. The sin had to do with memory. Now, memory is a tricky thing. We, we, we shouldn't ignore that. Especially when we're talking about memory and sin. Does a child sin when she forgets to do one of the chores that her parents gave? Depends on a whole bunch of different things, right? Was it really just forgetfulness? Or 
Was her forgetfulness caused by her not really caring about what her parents do? Not caring about what her parents say? What happened that day? Was there something major, something stressful that happened that day that could very naturally push that everyday chore out of her mind? What is the chore? Is it something that, that really does have to happen every day? Well, not so much. We get the point. Right? Forgetting is not always a sin. Sometimes we feel guilty when we forget something when we really shouldn't. Sometimes forgetting is just a failure of memory. Maybe perhaps we could say a consequence of a sin. We, we live in a sinful world. We are not perfect. Our memories aren't perfect. Nothing about us is perfect. But not, not in and of itself a sin. But then again, sometimes it is. Take Zechariah, for example. What is it that Zechariah forgot? Zechariah responded to Gabriel's message to him with doubt. How can I be sure of this? That doubt was caused by Zechariah's forgetfulness. What he forgot was what the main message of the Old Testament was. He forgot what the main message of the entire Levitical priesthood was. His job, his vocation, his holy duty given to him and a few other men. That everything they did was all about reminding the people, teaching the people that the Messiah would come and redeem all. Buy back, purchase everyone back from sin, death, and the devil. That's why Zechariah was disciplined. That's, that's some pretty bad forgetfulness. That's a lack of trust. Now, again, what are we talking about with forgetting and remembering? I'm not saying that Zechariah did not intellectually remember that God had promised a Messiah who would redeem the world. I'm sure Zechariah still knew that in his head. But there was something lacking in his trust about that. That's what led to this doubt. How can I be sure? The message that, that Gabriel gave to Zechariah is that his son would be John, and that he would prepare a people for the Lord. In other words, the Redeemer's coming. Zechariah, you're getting this special privilege. You get to know that it's going to happen soon. Your son is going to prepare the people for the Redeemer. That's a pretty big deal that Zachariah says, well, how can I be sure of this? There was something lacking in his trust of that promise of redemption. The discipline worked. The discipline worked. To compare this song from Zacharias here to, to his earlier words of doubt, this is a repentant man who now really remembers his redemption. Zechariah says, Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited us and prepared redemption for his people. Jesus hasn't been born. John hasn't been born. But how does Zechariah speak? Did you catch that? In the past tense. He has visited us and prepared redemption for his people. This is no longer a man with doubts. This is a man overflowing with confidence in his Lord. So sure is he that this promise is going to be fulfilled, that the Redeemer is coming, that he's going to redeem all, that he can speak of it in the past. It has happened. Remember your redemption as God remembered his hope. Zechariah connects God showing mercy to God remembering the covenant. In order to show mercy to our fathers by remembering his holy covenant, the promise. Referred to in our, our Old Testament lesson, it's not just about 
Abraham being the ancestor of many nations and many kings. Let me just highlight one of the verses there, show you it's about more than that. I will establish my covenant between you, between me and you and your descendants after you as an everlasting covenant throughout their generations. I will be your God. Remember in other areas that covenant is, is spelled out a little bit more that Abraham, through Abraham, God would bless all nations. The only way for that to be fulfilled, the only possible meaning of that, is that it's a reference to the Messiah, to the Redeemer. Remember your covenant, remember your redemption as God remembered this covenant. Now, of course, we cannot remember anything that God remembers, right? As we said, our memories are faulty. Our, memory, our memories fail. God's memory is perfect. It's literally impossible for God to forget something. But remember how God remembered this covenant. He orchestrated all of human history to bring about that moment in Bethlehem when a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David, a cousin of John would be born. All the various pieces that had to be put in place for Jesus to be born at just the right time. During during what's called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, and the Roman Empire controlled completely such a huge part of the world that people could go and come and go travel freely so that the news about Jesus, especially after his resurrection, could spread to so many people. Everything would happen at just the right time. God orchestrated all of it so that would happen. That's God remembering this book. Time and time again, God's people, for their part, broke the covenant. But time and time again, God renewed his love for the people, remembered his heart. This is how we are to remember our redemptions. By spending a whole lot of time thinking about them, God thought about his covenant a lot. Remembering our redemptions is a lot more than just remembering, oh yes, I was redeemed, and then going on and spending way more of my life on other frivolous, meaningless, even sinful things. Remember your redemptions. God remember his covenant. Think on it. Concentrate on it. Remember what it means. You, a sinner, we're redeemed. Do you remember from your catechism days what redemption means? I always explain it to catechism students. I ask if they've studied slavery in the American South, and usually they have. And I ask them if they know who the abolitionists were, and usually they don't. Abolitionists, usually northerners, white northerners against slavery, who did what they could to try to stop slavery. Sometimes an abolitionist will even go down to the South and purchase a slave bring them back to the north, and set them free. That's what redeem means. That was a big price. Slaves weren't cheap. Of course, the price that Jesus had to pay for our redemption is the greatest price there could possibly be. The life and death of God's own son. Meditate upon your redemption. Remember your redemption. Make the, the, the memory of your redemption, a regular part of your life. Let us be, in this new year, spiritual people who meditate upon our redemptions. Let us be biblical people. And when we read the Bible, we read it as it's intended to. Right. That we focus on the main point. Look for Jesus. Look for gospel. Look for references to redemption. Remember your redemption as, as God remembered his covenant. And as those who have been redeemed for a purpose, to serve God. In his song, there we go, Zechariah says, so that we are able to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. 
towards anyone who could have had the idea that he should serve God in Eden. And he's that right. Had a conversation with an angel and then was given discipline. Not able to speak. But yet, that's not the approach Zachariah takes. He's talking about serving God without fear. Righteousness and holiness before him all our days. We were redeemed for a purpose. To serve. There's really a more important thing that brings smiles to our faces on, you know, during those Christmas Eve services, right? It's not, ah, oh, the kids forgot something, of course. What really brings a smile to our faces is their joy in proclaiming the Christian story. Not out of fear. Maybe there is some fear. You know, we always admire the children for that. They're, some of them are a little bit nervous, a little bit afraid to be up here in front of everyone. They're used to look in this direction, and all of a sudden they see all of your faces. But fear is not the reason they're up there. They're up there because they love to tell the story. They love to proclaim that Christmas message. They do so, do so maybe with some, some, some little bit of fear, a little bit of nervousness, but also great joy. Serve God without fear. Yeah, you've been bought back from sin, death, and the devil for a purpose. To serve God. But the reason is not out of fear. Serving other people. Loving other people. Doing what's best for them. Coming to church. Bringing your, your offerings to God. Those things are not to be done out of fear. It's joy. It's thankfulness that we have been set free. That we have been redeemed. During this, this, this start of a new year, we have an opportunity to reflect. Reflect upon the ways in which we serve God and serve others. How we've done so in the last year. Perhaps how we can do so in 2022. There are so many different ways, right? So many different ways you can serve God. At home, at your job, at your family, at church, with your friends and neighbors. Focus on doing so out of love and thankfulness. It's not a, well, I have to do this. It's an opportunity. I've been set free. I am redeemed. I am a son of God, not a slave. How can I serve him in ways that show thankfulness to him? In ways that, that proclaim his glory and his love to other people? By now, most of you have probably opened all your Christmas gifts. Maybe you still have some family members yet to get together with. Most of us have just a pile of new stuff in our lives. The reality is some of it's going to be forgotten pretty quick. Some of it's going to be put on a shelf, put in a closet, put back in the box, and maybe never touched again. Maybe never used again. It's fine, maybe. Right? That happens. Don't let that happen to you. You've been redeemed. Purchased by Jesus himself. And he gives you as a gift to other people. Don't let you be put to waste. Don't let you be discarded. In other words, don't discard yourself. Don't waste yourself. You are a precious gift given by Jesus to other people. Remember your redemption as God remembers his covenant and as people who get to serve God. Amen. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Please stand. Let's confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, 
He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Fellow Divinity member Joanne Danner uh, has been diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 and is uh, quite quite ill, not feeling very well at all. She's not hospitalized, um, but she's quite sick. So let's pray for Joanne. Compassionate Father, in your mercy, you transform even sickness and disease into a blessing for your children. With this confidence, we commit all who are sick or suffering to your tender care. We pray especially for Joanne. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant patient endurance if her suffering must linger. Help her find true spiritual strength in Jesus and his cross during this time of physical weakness. By the work of the Holy Spirit, teach her to trust in your forgiveness, grace, and love. In Jesus' name we pray, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 